What's up, everyone? Welcome back to an all-new season of Coffee and Commerce. Super excited to be with my co-host and the legend himself, Mr. Gary Vaynerchuk. Thank you, Zubin. It's great to see you. You're looking good, cleanly shaved, looking fresh. I'm excited to be back for season two. I know we have a big time guest. And, uh, you know, the e-commerce world continues to evolve in such a fun way uh, and an important way. And uh, I'm excited to be here with you. Likewise. So to kick things off, given where we are from a macro standpoint, there uh, are talks of recession. We've got capital tightening in the marketplace. So we want to bring as much value as possible. So we decided who better to bring than someone whose company crushed it in the last economic downturn, un uh, in the last economic uncertainty, Scott Boylan, CEO of All Star. So we're going to bring Scott in right now. Scott's company was created the Snuggie, perhaps the biggest hit of the last recession. So there's a ton to learn from him. I love that. Uh, I'm excited to have him here. And real quick, while he's coming on board, just want to say what's up to Cody Bell and to Samuel Miller and to Scott Gilbert and to Dustin Ruther and TC. I mean, the, the Susan on LinkedIn, Thomas McHugh. So a lot of fun. A lot of people in the comments. We see you. I see you. I want to say what's up. Thank you so much. Mark Russell. Good to see you, Morgan Owen. Bowler Brown. That was a mouthful. Uh, Robert Hill's a lot easier. Uh, great to see all of you. Thanks for being here. And uh, let's bring him in because you're right. The Snuggie really um, is a case study that I personally admire. What's going on, guys? What's up, brother? Scott. All good. All good. I also admire Scott's gun. Scott, you work out, huh, bro? You <laughs> threw the shirt, bro. I appreciate it. We do what we can. <laughs> You mean take us away. Scott, great to have you. Um, like I said at the onset, so with the economic uncertainty that we're in right now, we want this episode to be focused on innovating and not just innovating, but selling and making money during economic uncertainty. So we got Scott Boylan, CEO of All Star, the company behind the Snuggie. Welcome, Scott. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So Scott, take us back. Um, many of us, Last time we had economic uncertainty, massive economic uncertainty, 07, 08, the one product that came out and was a case study for pretty much everyone about how to innovate when there are downturns, how to create products that consumers want and how to make money in any environment. And everyone kept talking about the Snuggie. And this is your first interview or first podcast ever talking about the Snuggie. So we're super excited for that. Tell us about that journey. No, it was really interesting. So it was about 2008, and I've, yeah, I get asked all the time because it was one of the first viral campaigns, right? And how did you create that? And they call me up, and it's a pretty easy answer. We didn't create anything. I still don't believe you could create a total vir virality, but you got, as I always say, we didn't light that fire. We were smart enough to blow on it. But when you really look at the Snuggie and like, how do you make money in the downturn? You almost have to peel it back a few years because I think companies that say, OK, there's a downturn. Now we're going to seize on opportunities. It's really strong companies that are sustainable and understand how to win and profit wins. Right. So all these companies that come into these downturns, they're usually growth companies and high level companies. And when a problem happens, they have none of the fundamentals and none of the strategies to succeed. So, you know, we had a a bumpy ride up, right? It was, you know, we're a self-funded company. We started it, you know, did everything from two, three people. At that point, we probably had 40. And by the end of it, we had 60. So we had grown every part of that company and every penny mattered from sourcing to logistics, to finance, to how we marketed. And when 2008, 2009 happened, we were just opportunistic, right? And I can fast forward to today. What happened then is big companies, and I don't understand this, media drops half the rate and they run away because there's a recession. So media blows wide open. So we just happen to have the right product at the right time and we don't pick them. Like I don't see a recession coming and say, okay, we got to jump all over that. We have a detailed testing model. We test hundreds of items. We put them on TV, we test them on web, we test them all over the place and the consumer decides. So we just happen to have the right product at the right time that made people feel good. Now, why did it blow up? because we were good at everything else. We were able to make a million a week. We had relationships at Walmart that got the front of the store. We knew how to run TV and we knew how to jump all over it. it wasn't hard. I mean, we don't have to be mathematicians that when we buy Meteor in July for a blanket and then it's half the price in November, 
it's going to triple in response and quadruple. So just everything worked in that time to make that win. And I always say profit wins, right? So if you're really driving and driving towards a profitable company, when bad times happen, you have the strength to succeed. Smart. Yeah, no, it's really funny listening to that direct mail, radio, print, you know, television of the 60s and 70s, remnant TV, cable TV, Google AdWords is how I did it. Uh, TikTok is how some people are doing it today. It's always the same story in different versions, which is you have actual operators that know where the consumer attention is. They take advantage of an arbitrage. He just explained perfectly his, which was, we were agnostic. If the math works, the math works. And when Coca-Cola and BMW go away because they're not real, you know, they're executives. Like that's just the truth at the end of the day. They're executives and your entrepreneurial practitionership gave you that advantage. And when I, you know, Zubin, when I look at the comments, and look at the art, right? So many more people can associate with that story. Now they may not have the budgets to do it on TV the way he did, but they can do that today, right this second on YouTube shorts for no media exposure, the virality's there. People don't recognize the moment. And I think when listening to that, that was a big story of recognizing the moment. Yeah. And it's about chasing the win, right? So you have to be nimble enough to see these opportunities and big enough to take advantage of them. But like Gary just said, small companies could still take advantage of them also. You just have to see where they are and be nimble enough to react to them and have all of your foundational principles right and then just lean in. I think some of these times are better to lean in. Um, there's going to be brands out there to bought right now. There's just there's a lot of headwinds out there, but there's still tremendous opportunities. You know, the other thing that struck a chord with me, Scott, and what you mentioned was profitability. And I think that the reason why Gary and I started working with one another to begin with was because that's the thing that we connected on, which was so many of these direct to consumer brands. And it's not to say it's a bad thing. It took VC funding, private equity funding, whatnot. And so the goal of that organization is not necessarily to make money. In fact, it's oftentimes not to make money at the cost of user acquisition or new customers. And now, fast forward where we are right now, we're seeing it in the market. Companies aren't getting financing unless they are profitable. And we're back to these business fundamentals that had almost been forgotten over the past few years. Uh, talk to us a little bit about how you maintained and still do with your other products profitability even when something is blowing up as fast as it is? So we, we, we advertise a little different than a lot of companies. We're a complete ROAS model. We're old school as seen on TV. We actually started off in direct mail, freestanding inserts, credit card things. We use advertising to fund our basically, we use advertising to fund the campaign like anybody else, but we may spend $10 million and we make $8 million back in profit. So in fact, that advertising only cost us $2 million. So we had an 80% return on ad spend. So yeah. the way we do it on a direct to consumer basis and providing value that way, direct shipping and having every cost and everything line allows us to run triple the media of another company, maybe five times the media of another company. I mean, you just brought up something interesting to me because, you know, five years ago, if I wasn't so strong in my convictions, I would have thought I was a dinosaur that was getting extinct because I would go to trade shows and I had kids and I would say they're kids because they were 21 years old and I'm not. <laughs> Right. And they would tell me retail's dead. And I said, you guys, I've been doing this a long time. One thing you have to know is there's two things. There's a pendulum that shifts all over the place. You have to be selling all places. You, we learned a long time ago, you can't tell your consumer where to buy. You have to be where they want to buy. Now, that's not everybody's model, but that's our model. So to not be at retail. So many of these companies were all over Facebook, Instagram. Well, what happens? iOS 14 and their one channel gets shut down. That's right. You have to be everywhere right now and let your consumer have that. The other thing that happened, I was with a group and I really thought it was an interesting opportunity for us to partner on brands. And they told me my model is broken. We will never be able to sell anything. We will never build a brand for one reason we make profit and that's crushing our valuations. That's ridiculous. <laughs> I was like, you have, and this was a guy from Harvard, worked at one of the biggest banks, raised a ton of money 
on this spectrum. I go, I've just seen this over too many years. That's early day internet. That's early profit wins, sustainable businesses win. And that's what we're seeing right now. I mean, it's, it's, it really goes back to it. Right? I mean, it's real. I mean, I, you know, again, I think we're all kind of like high-fiving here, but like, it's exciting. I want everybody to hear this. Like in what world, in what world could a simple statement as profit is bad be real? Of course there's, I don't invest. Here's where profit can be bad if somebody wants to be a stickler. You're taking all the money out of the business to buy Corvettes and boats and you're not doing the right thing by the business and eventually the golden goose dies, oftentimes by a second generation operator, whether it's a family business or a difference, fine. But other than that, to your point, the logic around this, it makes me, it makes me laugh how people don't understand tried and true things are real. We, we, we have this almost infatuation to make up new variables when some of this, like I'll give you a great one. Somehow, people have decided hard work is not part of the equation. <laughs> you know, like people like to razz me, like, Gary, you go too hard. I'm like, no, 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 no. I say, if you want something extraordinary, you've got to put in the work. For some reason, back to the nice compliment I gave you, when we see <laughs> muscles, and of course there's steroids and HGA, I get it, but like, there's work. And like, I hear people like, Gary, you don't get it. I don't work hard, I work smart. I'm like, cool, I work hard and smart, now what? Like, you know, like, like I, I, people try to reinvent truths, like work ethic. I, I am the number one fucking fan on earth of mental health. I am the least anxious. I'm not, I, I literally wake up kissing the world because I'm grateful for the lack of anxiety. I am, I sleep eight hours a day. I believe in it the most. I'm all about all these things. Yet, just because I believe in work ethic, people try to paint a fake narrative and try to, actually debate me on this notion. I've got a big news alert for everybody. Hard work ethic is part of the equation towards outsized success. It's part of the equation, the end. And profit, to your point, like when did not making money sound like a good idea? I will never understand that. No, it's insane. I was at a, uh, I was at a, basically I lectured. I didn't lecture, I've never really lectured. Like this is my first podcast. I was asked to, guest speak at Syracuse University at their entrepreneurship programs, probably 12 years ago around Snuggie. Um, and somebody asked me, what's your key to being an entrepreneurial success? <clears throat> and I said, you know, no one's ever asked me that before. So it was just give me one second. I said, here's the only thing I can tell you. If you're in a room with 100 on other entrepreneurs, I can guarantee you there are smarter people than you. I could also guarantee you you'll be the hardest working person there. And if you are, you will find success. You just have to find your path. This is very important. Mm. Brian M goes, so how do you keep a good work ethic without getting burnt out? Two things pop to my mind. I'd love to hear from you both because you've had your successes and they're real. One, when you genuinely love the thing you're doing, you're playing. Yeah. Like, like I'm not doing it for the money. I'm doing it because I like being an entrepreneur the way people like sailing and eating pizza and watching movies and playing golf. So that's one way. This is why I've always loved passion. Number two, here's a big one. I love it the most, I love it the most, comma, if I wake up and it's raining outside and it's just kind of a shitty day, I'm okay with having an off day, off week, off month on the grind because I'm not gonna judge myself in a nanosecond of a 60 year career and so it's about having a relationship of self love that you don't beat yourself up if you've had a bad quarter, let alone a bad day. Thoughts, men? So you're definitely more evolved than me, um, you know, because I love some of the things you're saying. I think, you know, somebody gave me a compliment the other day that I took as a, that I took as insult. A self, a self, no, it wasn't an insult. It was a self-reflection. They said, somebody said, oh, Scott's still working. And the other guy goes, he hustles like he's 25 years old and doesn't have a penny to his name. And some of that is a little bit true and maybe it's too true. Some of it's fear of losing. Some of it's love of winning. Right. And I do love what I do and I want to achieve. And now we're partnering with a lot of smaller brands. And I will tell you, some of the youth there, I mean, I, have, I live for energy. I feed off energy. Right. Yeah. So some of these younger kids that are building brands have such, well, they have one thing for them and one thing against them. They have tremendous positivity. And I love that. But they don't have a plan. Right. So you need everybody has a thing. So positivity with a plan, we're help putting a plan around them. So working with them to do things that we've never been good at really just 
focusing on that brand and microing that brand and putting it on our platform really, really gives me energy. But real, I don't real consider quick, it work. I, I'll do this 25 more years. If I real quick, that. Liz goes, I know he caters to the young people, but a 60 year olds, I love this guy. I just want everybody to know on the record, since I've got this great opportunity with Liz, I surely do not cater to the young. <laughs> I think what, what you're seeing, how old are you, my friend? Liz or me? Yeah, you. 55. Right. 55, 46. And we are young here because we like it. I cater to that energy, not what the birth certificate says. I think because of the platforms I put out content, I'm not doing Shark Tank, I'm doing TikTok. Sure, it looks like it to the young, but I'm catering to the practical optimists. And if you listen to what he just said, they have the youth and excitement, but they don't have the plan. I'm obsessed with optimism. When people hear optimism, they think delusion. I don't. I think optimism is actually the single most practical human trait to being an entrepreneur, but it has to be grounded in reality. When I have people roll up to me and being like, I'm gonna be a billionaire, I'm like, cool. And my next question is how? They're like, well, I'm gonna grind for it. I'm like, that's not going to be it. Like, and so like, you know, those are the conversations. Yeah, I love Two it. And has a, I, would, I would think some of the younger people, you know, and, and maybe I was like this when I first started out, but they're so linear. Right. Here's my plan. And this A is going to happen. B is going to happen. Uh -huh. C is going to happen. And I'm going to be a billionaire. Or these are the five steps I'm going to do in my career. I'm going to work here. I'm going to go to this bank. I'm going to go here. And I'm like, you're like a stick in a stream. Right. You're going to get dropped in there. And I, I think your positivity and you're smart as can be. You're going to get to the bottom. But if you don't realize you're going to bounce off all these rocks and let that stream take you, you're going to get stuck. Right. And so I think that's the energy you need. But you got to be able to be nimble and flow. And it's because they don't have the experience so they don't have the pattern recognition to go last time i tried to do this and go linearly i had to go left and right and forward and backwards mm -hmm. and it's totally fine with that so the thing i was going to mention earlier i think for both of you having spent time with both of you the reason why you have that work-life balance or whatever you want to call it is because you enjoy what you do and you're helping other people as you do it in conversations with scott he's always mentioned to me like disproportionately give to the people that work for you versus like what you're taking. Gary, I mean, I've been working now for Gary for the last three years and I cannot say enough great things about him. But one of the things I'll tell you is he surrounded himself with people that are kind and want to help and more importantly, do this not only for their own benefit, but to benefit him. And I think that's a yeah. really important point in terms of partnerships to find those people that it's you want to win. It's all the same thing, right? Uh, there's a guy in the comments right now saying, "Did uh, DJT Love goes, stop lying, you guys, this is full of shit. He goes, you all didn't hustle, you guys got lucky. And I think a lot about the makeup of that comment and like really believing in that. Life is so about perspective. When you talk, you were just talking and he was commenting and I was thinking, I'm like, man, when, when, when I, you know, Zubin, you know under the hood, but like when we're here, this is public and, I'm very empathetic to people being cynical or like not fully trusting. We live in a very complex world. And I, I think it's so practical to be optimistic and give to others. Cause I, I really think when you do good things happen to you. I just actually think it's very logical, but I was also raised by an optimistic mother. My father was raised by a pessimistic mother and he's more like my friend in the comments here. You guys got lucky, it's cynical, it's a jealousy and envy framework. And I don't see that as a bad thing. I don't get mad at that comment. I actually have deep compassion for it. The reason I like to do this, the reason I say yes to this show, why I wanted to be on today is we're like, if one, per, you know, when he says you're sell it, I have nothing to sell. Like, like, like this is, I don't, there's no mastermind. There's no marketing class. Like there's nothing to sell. It's the idea of if one person watching right now, Alex T, Rick Williams, Derek Baker, if one human hears any one of us three say something in a way they have never heard it before, or how about this? My favorite one, say something they've heard 13 times before, but today, Wednesday, September 7th, 2022 at 436 Eastern, 136 Pacific was the exact moment they were ready to fucking hear it and go, you know what? I have been excuse oriented or I have been, you know, not accountable or I haven't taken advantage of the arbitrages of what these guys are talking about. 
then that's like the best feeling because the emails I get from people saying this video in 2016 changed the course of my life and my family's life is way more delicious than another zero on my bank account. You know, so he says you got lucky, right? So in some ways you could say he's right, right? But you put yourself in more positions to be lucky. And that goes back to the grind, right? You know, I, I Snuggy was lucky. We had the right product at the right time. We were able to take advantage of it. We had 50 failures before that, right? So you have to keep grinding it out and putting yourself in position and building that platform. So in some ways, he's, he's right. There's some luck involved, I would guess. But way, I, would argue, I would argue any human being watching this right now is obnoxiously lucky. Your parents have sex at the exact right second to make you a human being. 400 trillion to one modern scientists, mathematical odds of being a human being. I don't want to hear a word from anybody's fucking mouth. Everyone's lucky. Your mom could have got up for another glass of wine and you wouldn't exist. I agree. I mean, that conversation is ridiculous. There's people who literally had a tree fall on their head today. Yeah. They were unlucky, right? I was fucking, I'm the luckiest. I was traded for wheat. I was born in the Soviet Union, a fucking shithole, and fucking was able to be traded for wheat because of a lucky moment in cold war history ended up in America, the entrepreneurial heaven of all time as an entrepreneur. I'm 100% lucky. Good, now what? My big thing to my friends and acquaintances and strangers who use luck as a weapon to make themselves feel better is, okay, and now what? Did that make you feel better? Cool, we're all lucky, now what? I agree. I don't know. So being you good, you're like taking that in, or what? You kind of. I'm, 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 I'm just taking it all in. Look, I uh, totally agree with both of you. I think that there's luck in everything, but it's also, I think, it goes back to what you were mentioning about parents' upbringing and having a pessimistic outlook on things or an optimistic outlook on things. There was yeah. a gentleman, I think, uh, who was just whose comment just popped up that he's been making money for other people for many years. And he's barely scraping by. Yeah. And what I'll say is that there are many ways to look at that. But the one of the ways to look at that is if you can make money for one person, you can make money for a lot of people. And if you can make money for other people, make money for people who value you and allow you to make money alongside them. 100%. And not this zero sum game that I'm gonna extract as much as I can from you. I'm reading it too. I just saw his comment. I, I'm devastated. Working 16 and 18 hours a day for somebody else who's treating you like shit. But then my brain goes to like, fucking, you gotta quit. You just like, like, if you're in control and that is like powerful to believe in, like I say all the time to my friends, you, everybody here knows the last. 15 years of politics have been decisive. I have had Democrat and Republican friends tell me, if this guy wins the election or if this girl wins the election, I'm moving to Canada. Meanwhile, every Republican and Democrat's still fucking here, right? But what I remind those friends when they're crying, when it's not their four year or eight year era, I remind them, Sweden's available, New Zealand's open. You wanna be Bitcoined out? El Salvador's ready for you. Like, it's inconvenient. Uh, by the way, a lot of my friends moved to Miami to not pay taxes. Now they're moving back because they're yep. bored because New York's back and open. I don't know. Like, you're in control. Do your fucking thing. No, I listen, you mentioned being an entrepreneur, right, and how you got lucky and everything. And that was, you know, a bunch of years ago. There's never been a better time in the history of the United States to be an entrepreneur. I mean, everything we've, you know, Shopify has democratized everything, going direct to the consumer. I mean, you talk about the great resignation. There are opportunities out there. I've seen kids make millions of dollars from the kitchen table just doing Amazon right, awesome. when that started. I said, if I had a criticism of my company and myself, it's almost not being nimble enough, right? Yeah. We were on, as seen on TV, we missed early days Facebook, right? You're jumping on TikTok or a year too late, right? You got to be able to take advantage of the opportunities. And sometimes they're right in front of you. And you can do, I mean, the great thing I hear, you know, because I, I get so frustrated, Carrie, also some of the things you said, you know, work-life balance is great, but you still got to work, right? Doesn't mean it's just all balance, but I love this side hustle concept, right? That's the first time I started hearing about that is the last, you know, seven, eight, nine years. And, and some of these kids are crushing it. They're working full-time jobs and they're building businesses on the side and then they're taking them and they have businesses and they did it from a kitchen table because you could do that these days right it comes down to big company small company what are your fundamentals what's your path to profitability you know what's your plan and then build from there and that's in every segment of business that we go into or anybody goes into 
I think perspective is just incredible. Like I, once you have the emotional strength to have compassion for others, all these things, I think about it constantly. Like uh, so much of why I'm so outward with my persona is because I can handle the negativity because I deal with it as not an indication to me, but I de- I, I come from a place of gratitude that I'm not in that place and I want more good for them even when they're telling me I suck shit. Yeah, and, and, trying, to, and trying to plan your everything is impossible, right? And that's where you really just got to roll. You asked about Snuggy, right? And, and we were the first viral campaign. There was barely any social media. We I want for anything. I want everybody to see what just happened. DGT Love just said, I apologize if I've offended anyone. I'm working the life out of me and I'm being drained. This is something I want everybody who's been watching to watch. I love this dude. And instead of what most people do on shows like this, when he was coming with the heat early on and somebody behind the scenes would have banned him or the public face that's paying attention like me would have shit on him. We come with real conversations and empathy. We had a conversation here for the last 10 minutes and look what it leads to. And this is the civility that this country desperately needs. We have to have like, of course people should see the world differently. We come from different angles, different pers- but we have to have the capacity to not be in such conflict and that's how you lead to great things in organizations, in governments, in families and like I'm excited about that. This like made my day. This GT love post. It made my day. And yeah, no one was offended. Like not not one bit. I know that if DG is if he's going to come here and say the things he was saying, trying to hurt us, it means he was hurting. Yeah. I don't know, I just, anyway, I know we got a little side off track. Here's what I would like to say, cause then I've got to bounce and you guys maybe can continue. The story of, you just completely rocked me with my favorite thing. All the companies ran away, we ran towards yep. it. And, and honestly, to tie in what we talked about for the last 10 minutes of mindset, in business and in life, the game is very simple. You either stare fear in the face or you run away from it. And I would argue that when the economy gets soft and people run away, that is reacting to the fear. And then there are people like our, our fine man here who ran into the opportunity. I think with all the things we're talking about with mindset and perspective, it's either you are running away from the fear or you're understanding fear is not scary. We all lose, we all make mistakes. We failed, listen what he said, we failed 50 times. But, and, and that's, it's very real and like, I don't know if there's a day that doesn't go by where I do tons of mistakes, dumb shit, big mistakes, sometimes a full year. I can think of three years in a row where I don't think I was at my best running this company, but the last two years being a fucking on fire closes all those gaps. Now, and, and, and how much time do you think every time you fail? Um, usually not very long, mainly exactly. because I don't value other people saying I'm good yep. or I'm bad. Meaning the thing that allows me to live my public life is when everyone says I'm the goat or I'm the best or you're a genius, I don't believe them either. I'm not a piece of shit, but I'm also not the greatest of all time. I'm just trying to do my thing out here and I stay down that middle. But what I think I'm getting at is that you don't sit there and sulk about one thing after another. It's like, move on, get to the next thing, take that 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 next step. Because I'm not looking to use sulking or excuses as a thing to propel me and prop me yeah. up in the eyes of my contemporaries. Yeah, I, I like to I like to take failure and say, okay, what did I learn from it? 100%. Right, and, and how did I how did I get better from that? And how does that prepare? Luckily enough, we keep our failures to a minimum that nothing's ever brought us down. You know, you know, you mentioned, exactly. you, know, you know, and you surround yourself with good people. It helps because. I'm an optimist by like, they, they call it scoptimism in my company, right? So I never see anything as bad, right? So I need somebody sometimes to say, hey, this isn't working, right? We need to take a look at what's happening here. I know you believe in it. I have a sign in my office that says never fall in love with a product because I can't tell you how many times I have. And six different times I'd redo the creative, I'd change it. I love I that. It sucks, right? I love that. I love, I'm so the same way. Like I always think I'm right, but in the face of being wrong, I'm like, fuck it, I'm wrong. And that humility and like, I love that. Anyway, I got to run. I'll let you guys go and we'll talk soon. Thank you, brother. And to 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 start business that the consumer decides and that's what's good. Well, exactly. To your point, that's what I was just going to mention. One of the things that uh, from a VaynerMedia standpoint uh, was employed, I think last year uh, in this Vayner volume model of creative was the notion that 
we are not arrogant enough or whatever word you want to use to assume that we know what's right, what will resonate with consumers. We will put a ton out there and determine what does resonate with them and allow them to figure out what that is. Now, I think from your perspective, what's unique, and I'd love for you to kind of talk about this and all-star is your ability to either take products that exist or create new products and test a ton and figure out what works. Because there are a lot of folks watching right now that are interested in direct to consumer or have done stuff. And most probably they've only done one or two things and they haven't really tested enough to figure out what's going to work for them and what are they going to be passionate about and what are consumers going to care about? Yeah. So you can never pick a product, right? You know, you just can't, right? You could pick products that fit certain metrics that could work for a direct to consumer campaign. Does it solve a problem? Is there a white space? Does it, but at the end of the day, the consumer has to want it, right? So we have a testing model that starts with surveys and we've had probably 10,000 items put through this. So it's a learning model that gets better each time. So we put items through surveys. We'll do a quick little web test. We may make a prototype and put it on Facebook or Instagram. So before you go to market, just so everyone understands, before you go to market, you got an idea for a concept. You put it out in a survey to understand what kind of demand there is out there based on the demographic that you think is ideal yeah, for them. And we're not predicting success there. We're predicting failure. Our goal is to eliminate and minimize the amount of items that we actually spend money on shooting commercials and doing creatives. And at the end of the day, it's the consumer that decides. If we, you know, if we manufacture 5,000 pieces and we bring it in and we sell 100, there's nobody there. If we do a couple of ads and we put it out on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, or if we even do a TV spot and we blow through it in a week, well, then we have a big winner. And we always say our products sell at retail 100% of the time. Because if they're going to buy it direct to consumer from a company they never heard of, it's absolutely going to work when we build that awareness, right? So it's building the whole ecosystem up. So it's a test and learn model. Now, I've seen it done differently. So some of the young brands that are developing, they take one item and they believe in it. And they will go through so many iterations. And we love partnering with these companies because many times when they bring it to us and they're doing $4 million in sales, that's after three years. The first year they did $150,000. They talked to everybody from a customer service basis. They learned everything about that product. They kept iterating based on what they learned and what their brand was. That's a different model, but that's a fantastic model. And some of the big success stories of single product companies are absolutely being obsessed with their brand and their product and learning from it. And then we just take it and blow it up, right? Because we put it into our platform, we could do everything else. 100%. And I think that a couple of things there. One, the market's changed. Uh, there's a comment in here um, about uh, trying to find the comment here, but around the fact that what worked before um, isn't necessarily going to work uh, in the future. And it's from Dustin Beck. Old frameworks uh, aren't futuristic. I think that applies. Thank you. That applies across the board. So what do I mean by that? One, it has to do with like product creation, ideation, all of that before years ago, and even more recently, larger CPGs, they go through a long process to ideate, create products. It's often insulated from consumers. By the time they go to market, they basically just created it in a bubble. No one's actually ever seen it, heard of it, et cetera, and they're just hoping that it works. The other framework that I think is really important to get away from, now let's take a step back. If we take a look at direct to consumer when it first started, early 2000s, late 90s, there was not much consumer demand to buy off of a dot-com that you'd never heard of. And there wasn't much capital in the market, meaning investors weren't lined up, banks okay. weren't lined up to loan money. Some brands started, they got a little bit of traction. Fast forward to like 2005, you start getting some um, software like Shopify that comes into the mix. So you have technology that's enabling it. You've got capital that's coming in from an investment standpoint, banks are funding it, and consumer demand is growing. All of that basically culminates into what we experienced in 2020, 2021, and at the first half of this year, which was massive amounts of capital being available and accessible to direct to consumer brands, small and large, and consumer demand was there. But what happened, markets shifted, economic uncertainty, 90% of the brands that we were exposed to, that Scott was talking about earlier, were not focused on profit. They were focused on customer growth 
because the folks that had invested in them weren't interested in taking money off the table. They wanted them to go from $50 million losing a million a year to $100 million in revenue losing $5 million a year. Because it was a larger company, they could exit at a larger multiple. Capital dries up and back to frameworks shifting. We've got to go back. The irony is old frameworks aren't futuristic, but there are older frameworks that are futuristic and they are what we talk about in terms of business fundamentals and really thinking back and saying, hey, look at the pizza store down the pizza shop down the street or the restaurant. These companies, these restaurants, these small businesses across dry cleaners, they're not out there just getting net new customers and spending as much money as they can so they can do your laundry once or sell you pizza once. They survive based on providing great service, a great product and getting people to come back. And that's the framework and that's the big shift that if you're a Fortune 500 CPG all the way down to starting a product company in your garage, you've got to focus on retention. You've got to focus on making sure customers get value and targeting those that get the most value and building your business there. So with that, Scott, tell us a little bit about your customer testing again and when you find traction, what do you do? How do you scale kind of these opportunities? Yeah, so what makes us unique is is really our speed. If there's is one thing that makes us unique, it's our speed, right? So if you go to P and G or some other big CPG company, it's like you said, it's a five year process, pretty much done in a bubble. They'll put a big marketing spend behind it, and they hope it sells. We're testing live, right? We're going to believe in products that we survey. We're going to make a product. We're going to put it into the marketplace. And you know what surveys are worth? They're they're an indication. You know what really is a vote? Your credit card, right? So when consumers vote with their credit card that they want their product, once we have that, we are all systems go. We know we have a winner. We know we could advertise it. We know there's consumer demand where we do most of our manufacturing in China, but we do some in the United States. We're ramping up to be able to make huge quantities. We're placing it in every retailer. We're, we're advertising it everywhere and we're just ready to go, right? So we have products that sometimes go from test to mass retail distribution in eight months. Right. That's almost wow. unheard of right there. And that's probably one of the uniqueness of an old school as seen on TV company that grew up in that. It was always a speed game. It was always a race to market game. Now we've just put a lot more fundamentals over around it. So let, let's go to one other topic here. A couple of topics here. One, you talked about retail. I think it was a very important point you brought up. And I want to uh, double down on this here. You mentioned that if somebody is going to buy from a dot-com they've never heard of a product. Imagine what they'll do in retail when they go into a Target, when they go into a Walmart, where the credibility of the product is essentially the store. We've seen it, you've seen it. Even the buyer profiles of these big box retailers are shifting. They're bringing people in that have direct to consumer experience and they need and they ask for direct to consumer success, regardless of your organizational size, to have you on the shelf. So can you talk to us a little bit about because I wholeheartedly agree with you on not just selling on one channel. And when we talk about retail and we talk about kind of succeeding in retail, can you talk to us about some of the trends you're seeing in retail and how the folks that are listening in can maximize their opportunity to get into retail and succeed? Yeah. So I think selling to retail, if anything, it de-risks you, right? So when you're in any one channel, whether it be just retail, just Amazon, just your own D2C site. I mean, look what happened to all these companies with iOS 14. They were Facebook, Instagram companies that kind of went away. So selling a retail will de-risk you, but retail is really where all the volume is. And it still is, right? I would say 60, 70, 80% of our volume in any one campaign is from our retail sales, because that's where the consumer are. People say they're not shopping at retail. The average customer is in Walmart, I think two point something times a week. Now, retailers are changing. They you know, I had a senior VP at one of the largest retailers in the world say to me, we like DTC companies because you talk with your customers, not at them. So we're not just telling them we're taking, you know, some of our best product innovation comes from consumer insights. It comes from the early DTC sales. It determines how people are using it. That changes packaging. They ask for different features. So sometimes by the time we go to retail, the product has evolved, but you need a great quality product that could last a long time on the shelf because retailers want people very happy with the products that are coming in. I think some of the trends, they're less promotional based, they're more branded based right now. They're not just looking for single hot deals. They're looking for products with long-term staying power. But certain retailers are leaning in, like you know, Target wants to be known as a place where all the native brands go. 
and they have a unique customer coming in. Am I getting new customers in? So Walmart's now playing some of that space too. The clubs have actually done a real good job for a real long time doing that. So retailers are just another shopping, but they're just another shopping portal is all they are. Yeah, and I think that um, it's it's really important when you're starting out, right, to think through where your product fits, have some ideas about it, both in terms of the consumer you're targeting, as well as the retailers you ultimately want to get into, and then have those kind of uh, the ability to test these things and go out to market. You don't even have to spend a lot of money with the tools that are out there available to you right now. You can spend a minimal amount of money. We're talking about like hundreds of dollars to figure out and get some traction on what works. Um, Jose Velasquez uh, commented on YouTube, and I think it's a, it's a great point. He said, so the goal is to get your proof of demand ASAP so you can scale it. And it goes both ways. It's proof of demand as well as fail as fast as you can, right? There was a, a gentleman we used to work with, uh, Lauren Paddleford at uh, Shopify. Uh, he was a GM over there at Shopify Plus, master salesperson. Um, he would get you into his framework wherever you were. But one of the things I loved about what he said is get them to know as fast as you can. And if you get them to know you're not wasting your time, with somebody who is eventually going to get to know. It's the same with products. It's the same with everything we're talking about here. Because if you get a no, then you move on to the next thing. Scott? Yeah, here's the negative on retail, right? So and I agree with that 100%, right? You want to lean in on your winners, right? And get out of your losers as fast as you can. And that goes back to never falling in love with a product. And I only say that because I fall in love with so many products. And you lose significant money chasing products that consumers don't want. Yeah. But the issue out there right now for some of the smaller companies is, you know, I talk about starting businesses on your kitchen table and Amazon makes that real simple, right? They, the way their platform works, the way they handle fulfillment, you could do things small and you've seen a ton of small Shopify startups, right? That do a really good job. Retail requires a knowledge base and an infrastructure. So when you're ready to go to retail, that is the point where you better partner with some companies or bring in some senior level expertise that knows the logistics and knows how to sell retail. Because there's a lot that goes into that, a lot more than shipping direct to the consumer. So that's the point. So when you say building up, yeah, prove your scale, really prove it out. But when you're ready to go to retail, make sure you have the right partnerships or you bring in the right people to help you. Speaking of which, perfect segue, there are a few people asking in the comments how they can get in touch with you, Scott. Uh, you mind giving them your URL and however else you want them to get in touch with you? Yeah, we're at www.allstarinnovations.com. Um, that's probably the best way to get in touch with us. You know, as I said, I've never done a podcast, so I really not get that many forward inwards. It's a lot of relationship stuff. But yeah, we'll absolutely reach back out to you um, and I'll figure out a better way to connect if, if people start coming in. Amazing. Final question for you. And thanks to everyone who's tuned in. I hope you got a lot out of this. Final question for Scott. So thinking back on the Snuggie and the success you had when most brands were fighting just merely for survival, what was the biggest surprise for you in taking the product to market? And what did you learn that you uh, kind of take top of mind with you in everything you do? Um Keep top of not, to try to pre, not to try to pre-plan anything. The virality of it was completely unplanned. As I said, there was no virality back then, right? If I would go to VaynerMedia right now and say, I have a new product, I want to make sure you have Oprah wearing it and you're going to get me on Good Morning America. It's going to be on every news channel and it'll be the number one viral video. How much would that cost me? You're going to be like, we can't do that. You can't guarantee those things. So learning just to, to follow the path that's there and then to just lean in what it is. If there was a mistake in Snuggy, and we're bringing a lot more Snuggy back, 12 years in we launch it, we have, we've have spent millions of dollars launching so many other brands. Snuggy has so much more brand recognition, but we kind of stopped pursuing it. We still sell them, but Snuggy stands for so much more. It's fun, it's fashion, right? So that was a learning lesson that when you get those things that really respond to people, and you talk about in a recession, why do people buy Snuggy so much? You made them feel good. Right. For $14.99, it brought a smile to their face. And it was everybody's, you know, white elephant gift. So that was probably the number one learning is to follow the path that is don't just go linear with it, right? Take those things, lean into them, and go where go where the tide's going. Brilliant. Scott, thank follow you so much for your time. Appreciate it, Zubin. Really enjoyed it.
Thanks everyone for tuning in and we'll be back with another episode in just a few weeks. See you.